All right, very good morning. It is Friday, 3rd of April. I hope everyone is well. I'm just going to kick off firstly by saying please like and subscribe to the channel on YouTube if you don't already do so. It will be very much appreciated by everyone here, me included. Um, it does feel always a little bit odd just doing this at home. I think through my career I've gone from being sat on a trading floor delivering this to hundreds of people to then working um, as the head of a desk at a, a bigger company then broadcasting this to tens of thousands of people to now I'm, I'm kind of sat here at home on my own and uh, just so people uh, are clear here because I have had a few questions I do have trousers on I'm not uh, uh, it's not just a shirt and then my pajamas underneath so uh, just to make that clear but a couple things then here I just wanted to show you this is the uh, Amplify Trading website um, if you just search AmplifyTrading.com uh, one thing I just wanted to quickly show you was basically when you're on the home page if you scroll down uh, whether you're a trader or a student you can basically click the learn more because we have two quite distinct different arms of our business I'm more involved in the trader side if you click on that learn more on the trader side uh, we've just updated um, our, our web page so I'd really appreciate you guys checking it out uh, maybe give me some feedback just drop a comment on the video uh, I'd really like to get your, your thoughts so obviously a bit of a video here of what would be our normal operations from our trading floor in the city of London uh, a couple of kind of um, the, the things that explain what we do essentially uh, the morning briefing the members of the team so uh, these two guys Will and Piers are the co-founders of Amplify and they're going to be joining me uh, for a live Zoom private webinar if you did want to take part in that if you've not already registered then uh, I'm going to drop the, the link at the bottom in the description of this video so make sure you register for that I'm going to start half an hour before payrolls comes out we'll listen in watch it live analyze it and then do a bit of a debrief and and take some questions so absolutely welcome to join us uh, and then there's three different programs that we have um, in this this newly designed website it makes it way more clear uh, in my opinion so uh, do have a look there's the Amplify Now uh, portal which is something we just released brand new for 2020 uh, and that's uh, it's, I think it's about 72 on-demand videos delivered by specifically really the head of trading peers and myself uh, but what we've been doing we've added a new section where I do little macro snippets where I talk about say I did the live coverage of the, the jobless numbers yesterday uh, talk about tracking coronavirus but Sam North one of our traders and one of the senior mentors he also uh, does a daily strategy across different uh, products and asset classes so it's definitely worth checking out but anyway let's I'm gonna leave that up for you to have a look at in your own time um, but let's just get back to, to markets and what we're looking at and let's let's kick things off with just generally the the state of play at the moment obviously non-farm payrolls coming up uh, one of the main features of today but we'll get under the bonnet of that in a moment and what we're expecting uh, the main thing here is you know equities after such a, uh, a powerful week uh, that we saw last week uh, obviously we got up to that that high that we printed what on Tuesday uh, and we've been pulling back ever since really I mean you can see here on this chart on the, the top left where we hit that last week high on the test that another kind of double double top test and then we came all the way coming back down here we have recovered a little bit um, we failed really to break the the actual opening weekly low so if we're looking at actually the range of this week I mean this is the upper bound here and the lower bound and that has been respected in terms of uh, we had a, a, a false kind of break managed to close just above it on that candlestick on the print on the 30 minute uh, on the first so midweek and then same case again yesterday remember we had a run lower we had the jobless claims of course uh, and that kind of sets us up for the payroll number we're going to be looking at shortly uh, but that was quickly reversed remember what we saw a massive jump in crude oil at the time uh, and that came <laughs> I mean when you actually look at this chart you probably think well it doesn't look that big actually but I mean just to put things into context that candlestick there and that spike that's 25 percent 25 percent move in crude oil is massive I don't think I've ever seen anything like it in terms of that that severe a move over that short time frame I mean even when you think about those um, the Iranian drone attacks 
on the Saudi Aramco infrastructure at the back of September of last year. I and mean, we're talking more like 15%, and these were massive moves then. Now, talking about 25%. Interestingly, though, um, we have paired the majority of that move, and actually, I've not looked, but let's just quickly draw a fib on that uh, on that move to see whereabouts we are. So you know, I haven't really respected it too much, but you can see here we reversed more than 50% of the move already. Uh, and I'm gonna discuss why that's happened. Uh, and hopefully you managed to catch some of my commentary and tweets at the time, uh, because I definitely wasn't buying into the spike um, when it first happened. So let's get up into the news. If you did want more charts uh, and, and more from the technical side, obviously just reach out to, to Sam. Uh, on Twitter, SNorth19 is his handle. Um, but having a look here, let's have an update on the coronavirus. So um, I don't think it's particularly, um, from a market point of view, it's not going to move markets, but from a symbolic point of view, and abs you know, absolutely a milestone of how severe that this pandemic has been, total confirmed cases now have topped the 1 million mark globally, as you can see here on the left-hand side. The, t the death toll is over 50,000 worldwide, uh, the m most hardest hit country still remains that of Italy, just short of 14,000, followed by um, Spain, and then there's quite a significant drop down to then France, and then Hubei province in China, uh, Iran, and then the UK, followed by New York City, uh, actually, uh, New York City in itself. So, absolutely, this number, uh, unfortunately, continues to rise. The American confirmed cases now coming up to around a quarter million. Uh, and one would expect that to continue uh, that pace for at least another two weeks, probably in that acceleration phase. Uh, so it's going to get, unfortunately, a lot worse before it gets better. Um, coming back to markets, though, this is one of the things that, of course, um, we were looking at yesterday. Uh, and initially, you did see that kind of classic reaction. And, you know, there was, um, I, if you actually go on the YouTube channel, I did actually post. Um, a, a live running commentary I did over jobless and there was a really nice point of entry to get short on oil at that point to take about two dollars out of the price where you had a really great risk reward I know some of the guys in, in trading live uh, were there at the time and so not only was there equities and the equity move was you know you needed a little bit of patience uh, it took about 10 minutes really for it to gain a bit of traction before you saw a decent move actually. I mean, when you talk about the S&P, you are talking about what well, from the initial release to the low, you know, decent 40 point move. So it's, you know, that sounds small relative on the charts when you look at it because we're trading these these new larger ranges, but that, that was a really good move. Um, what has happened? Well, this is the chart you remember me showing this time yesterday before the latest jobless numbers came out. And that was when we were looking at the first time claims filed in the week to March 21st. And that was that 3.28 million we had last week. Well, now you can top that up. We had the number yesterday at 6.6 .6 million, which basically means that 10 million people um, have now hit you know, unemployed and are now searching in regards to um, benefits and, and initial jobless claims have shot higher and as you can see this really is quite unprecedented you know even the peaks in the global financial crisis you can see here was at 665 the 1980s recession peak was just a touch above that at 695 um, and so to be up here at 10 million is just absolutely uh, historical uh, in this sense um, what does this mean then going forward? Well, obviously, all eyes will be on payrolls now coming out in a few hours' time. Uh, the median consensus actually looks like it's been revised a little bit. Uh, still, though, looking for potentially uh, the, uh, the first negative print, basically, since 2010. As you can see here, the estimate on the street is for a minus 100,000 print. Now, there are a couple things here to be aware of. Um, first of all, I've mentioned this a few times, uh, although since the macro menu that I send uh, on a weekend, and that's about the reference period. Uh, so whenever, say, non-farm payrolls is conducted, there's a distinct kind of calendar date cutoff of where the data goes up to. Now, in this case, the reference period tends to be around the, the 12th, 13th of the month, meaning then that basically this data that we're going to see today in payrolls actually does not encapsulate the majority of the layoffs that we would have seen that have happened here. 
because this 10 million basically has happened after the date of which payrolls would have would have hit its deadline uh, if that makes sense so it's not going to capture the more widespread loss of employment which we're definitely going to see in the april payrolls report uh, which we'll, we'll talk about in a moment a few other things here i've made some notes from what i've been reading this morning uh, obviously non-farm payrolls is more than just one number uh, there's the unemployment rate uh, there's the um, average hourly earnings there's revisions to previous numbers and so on and so forth um, some of the key things here are um, wages and hours uh, they may be less reliable than usual because stretched and shut businesses might skip responding to the monthly survey now why might they skip well typically the numbers are based on voluntary responses from about about 150,000 businesses and government agencies so you know just given the stresses put upon these businesses perhaps then these voluntary submissions just haven't been able to be done um, so the kind of accuracy of the data as well might be subject to a few few questions in in and meaning that later on down the line we could see quite significant revisions to previous data uh, on the revision and the two month net Provision. Um, census workers are poised to add about 17,000 um, to the March payroll figure, according to the Bureau's tally of temporary hiring. But you know, 17,000 up in terms of employed is is in the next month going to be massively outweighed by the likelihood of multiple hundreds of thousands of people being um, unemployed. And with that being said, just wanted to give you uh, a graphical or a kind of a, a visual cue of what did payrolls look like during the global financial crisis of 2008-2009. And as you can see here, there were periods of when job losses were down and the, the kind of headline changing on farms was minus 800,000. Now today we're looking at a minus 100,000. I guess the question mark here, and it's, I mean, it's hard to, to with any accuracy say this, but we are gonna probably see some similar numbers to this, if not perhaps even more severe. So we're gonna print down around here and as you can see, even though we flirted and tested it a few times over the years, in recent memory, the zero number, this is going to be the first negative print. But in all honesty, we're going to be about here on the marker come the end of today, uh, perhaps with a variation between, let's say, zero and 300. But in next month's report, I would expect this to be all the way down in these areas here. Uh, and so, again... Yes, there's going to be volatility on today's number, but really to get a better insight as to the economic real implications that this pandemic has had, that might not be forthcoming until the kind of next coming data uh, in the, the weeks and months ahead. Just going back to payrolls then, the other thing um, that we're looking for is we are expecting, well, let's just have a quick look here what the unemployment rate currently looks like uh, in the in the US. So this is the this is encapsulating the again the period of the financial crisis so you can see here if you like they're they're an inverse relationship obviously uh, the amount of people the change in non farms um, has dropped so the unemployment rises so here you can see unemployment and financial crisis topped out at roughly around 10 percent before then we've had this graduated I just move it back here pull back down to what has been prior to all this happening despite a trade war and all these other things and, and fears of a recession already from 12 months ago unemployment rate in america was at record low territory however going forward given how severe this is going to be most people are anticipating now unemployment to rise into the mid teens that being over and above the worst of the unemployment situations seen in the kind of late 70s early 80s definitely above that of 10 percent of the financial crisis i think that will definitely be higher than that so yeah this is quite uh, as i said unprecedented in that sense um, one thing to be aware of here is the the u3 rate there are a few different statistical um, nuances between how unemployment is measured but the U3 rate is formally uh, as it's formally known may fail to capture the full extent of unemployment which is the main unemployment figure that we'll look at uh, because it only includes people actively looking for a job um, that means then that some of the other measures that come out as comprised as part of the payroll report 
um, including the participation rate and employment population ratio, should also be looked at for a better gauge about how severe the decline in unemployment is. So remember, just to make that clear, and do just jump on or leave me a, um, a question on the video or just go onto Investopedia. If you type in U3 unemployment rate, it will make a bit more sense. But essentially, it's people who are actively looking for a job. But if you're self-contained and you're self-isolating, then well, then how can you be out looking for a job? So it's a little bit difficult to really harness that that data to get a true reading of really what the underlying situation is it could underplay it which is where you've got to look at the participation ratio to get a better idea of, of how accurate that unemployment rate is um, the idea here then from a broader economic and trading perspective uh, I, I saw this this morning and I thought this was excellent because um, I definitely did a, a few tweets and I did a post on LinkedIn about some thoughts about what I feel about the, the virus going forward, more kind of medium term. Uh, and this I thought was quite interesting because this is mapping at the left hand side here, 2008 versus 2020. And the, uh, the blue line here is the S&P 500 during the era of the depths of the financial crisis. And the red line here, that kind of solid red line is the movement we've had in the S&P 500 uh, through the beginning of this year and then the trajectory of what this particular bank is looking at under two different scenarios. Scenario one, their bull case, uh, the outbreak peaks within the next two to four weeks, or their base case, a prolonged virus outbreak. And for me, uh, this virus to peak and then we kind of be you know, back on track again in the next two to four weeks, I think is absolutely not gonna happen. Uh, I've, I'm way more bearish than that, I would say. I think this is going to be much more protracted than, than people uh, are definitely underestimating this. Uh, one of the things I was talking about yesterday on Twitter, if I just quickly jump to it, there was a really good piece I saw. I know this is a bit small to see, but let me read it out to you. Um, this was in the Harvard Business Review, and I just thought it's something we've talked about in the briefing a lot, but it really summarizes it quite well. Uh, and it's talking about people somewhat almost complacency about just getting in control. The peak virus means that's the end, markets recover. Uh, for me, these points really are, uh, really, again, say it all. The virus properties are not fully understood and could change. The role of uh, asymptomatic patients is still imperfectly understood. The true rates of infection and immunity are therefore uncertain, especially when testing is limited. Uh, policy responses will be uneven, often delayed, and there will be missteps, and the reactions of firms and households are uncertain. And then another bullet point I think is, you know, I've spoken to a couple of people who are small business owners, uh, and they have really struggled where, you know, if you think about it, the government needs to stop the rot in markets. Uh, two weeks ago, markets were in free fall, record-breaking levels of volatility and predominantly to the downside when we're looking at equity markets. Massive stress on the market might not immediately impact uh, the guy on the street, but it certainly will do if it then is a trigger point to lead to a severe recession at that point. So governments have to come out and act. They have to in order to try to control this a runaway market before it even gets worse and the economic implications start to build even further. The problem they have then is the implementation. So when we talk about these stimulus measures and how they're going to help small and medium-sized enterprises, well, that's all well and good, but these small businesses can only survive for a very, very finite short period of time and without actually getting that available credit quickly, they can no longer exist and people get laid off and are unemployed and this is what was leading to these massive losses uh, of jobs and these big spikes in jobless claims that we're seeing. So yeah, that and the fact that you know this isn't a crisis born out of um, subprime or this kind of these investment vehicles or speculation, this is a pandemic and for me I do think that um, trying to harness then a virus which is still not really fully understood. The scientists still don't have a solution definitively yet, and scientific research takes time in terms of finding a full-on vaccine. So, yeah, as you can you could tell, I'm uh, a little bit bearish still on the, the kind of... I'm not, I'm not bearish as in a, I'm this massive bear. It's more of a view of, I just think, 
um, this notion that we're going to have a, a, a quick getting over of this, I think, is misplaced. Now, with that, here was uh, a good. This is where I saw these these good graphics that really show three things: the kind of shape of a recovery, and they were using as a case study 2008. And here, you've got the V-shaped recovery uh, that was witnessed in Canada who really averted a, a, a kind of recession during the global financial crisis and through the advent of kind of forward guidance. And this was where Mark Carney did such an excellent job before he became the Bank of England governor. They managed to basically have pre-crisis growth and actual growth track almost identical. So despite the little blip that you can see here, it's almost difficult to see. Uh, they just continued on track. Uh, as productivity grew with just the general business cycle over time. In America, we have now managed in recent years to basically run parallel to the pre-crisis growth trend, albeit off where we were. So we've kind of been put off track and just gone down a separate road, if you like. But then for Greece, I mean, this is the, the L shape. And this is kind of the, the, the worst case where economically it's still been not only was it massively damaging, it continues to have impeded their ability to grow to anywhere near their pre-crisis growth levels. Uh, so obviously these ones much more precarious um, economically, fiscally in, in these types of situations. So yeah, this is what we're looking at. When we're looking at the unemployment rate, remember workers exit the workforce, skills are lost and productivity goes down. So the bigger um, the more these jobless claims start coming out and let's say next week is another 6 million then another 6 million the unemployment rate goes from 8 to 10 to 12 to 15 all the more difficult it becomes to see this type of V and U shape and we start going down into more I guess not quite as perhaps as severe when it comes to somebody like the United States as an L shape because don't forget they are doing these mammoth stimulus packages but uh, again the, the longer term implications that you can derive here from an investment point of view from what we're seeing from these jobs data as well as the short term intraday to be able to trade to volatility. All right, final few things I just really want to cover off. Uh, this was yesterday. Um, you, might, you might have seen me uh, tweeting about this because I just, it was a, a crazy move when it happened. Uh, so basically, Trump tweeted as he does. Uh, and he he basically said that he's eyeing a global oil output cut of 10 million barrels a day. You know, I can almost imagine it. Trump Trump's probably sat there uh, in, in, in the White House. He's got his Bloomberg terminal, and he's like, right, okay, uh, Whiting Petroleum filed for bank, uh, Chapter 11 yesterday. Right, this is really going to be bad now. We know the virus is getting worse. Uh, all around the nation, I'm going to have to start intervening now in this oil price. Otherwise, it's going to go from 20 bucks to 16 to 10 pretty quickly. And then we're going to have mass unemployment in the oil and gas industry. Right. Tweet. Bang. 10 million. We're going to cut global. I've had a conversation with Russia and Saudi. We're all talking again. Market responds as it should do. Um, spikes higher aggressively. Trump then goes, wow. Oh my God, look, it's just spiked 25%. You know what? I'll tweet again. Actually, not 10, 15. He actually did that. And when he did that, I knew that this was just absolute BS. Uh, and so that's why I was quite critical at the time. And actually, you know, when it spiked up to, where do we get to in oil? We, I think we got up to about, let me just transition my chart here. We spiked all the way up to, 27.39 and then we came all the way tearing back down not that long after to 24.13 and I just couldn't you know I couldn't believe this was such a this was such a basic error I think on behalf of Trump that second tweet he just couldn't help himself uh, because it's one of those things where markets move on expectations um, not reality in a sense because there's no cut that's happened so far. He's just saying these things and the market instantly prices that in. Now, when he went from 10 to 15, now that doesn't sound like a lot. Okay, 10, 15, but actually that's you know another 5 million. So that's 50% of the entire cut that you've just been talking about being bolted on the top. So that's a massive difference. And for me, when you 
having spent you know the last 14 odd years watching the way that news comes out whenever i hear a comment like that for me the how i remain i guess rational or look for the trade is that trying to capture that tweet and that initial explosive move is pretty impossible to be fair it's so quick and there are you know algos hooked up to trade that sort of thing and you're never going to get really a hold of it in time but then for me it comes well hang about trump is saying this you know no one else is saying this and for me then um the 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 one thing that did come out was a, a third comment which was that saudi officials reportedly were looking to call for an emergency opec plus meeting that was when we hit the eventual top but for me well, where's russia and, and russia were not forthcoming and then it became apparent then uh that that basically they weren't talking um well, let me read you you through this so so how it came out was a second person familiar with the situation said trump's goal is purely aspirational and will ultimately hinge on whether saudi and russia reach a deal uh, an opec plus delegate familiar with the conversation similarly said saudi arabia and russia had yet to agree a production cut let alone its size uh, any proposed curves would be conditioned upon other major oil producers also agreeing to reduce production so you know think about it from a political point of view a management point of view you know you've just had a big oil firm going to going to bankruptcy yesterday uh, for trump trump remember is scheduled to meet with the likes of exxon chevron the big oil majors today so going into this he wants to you know promote a figure of strength if you like and so out come the comments. But at the end of the day, we remain exactly where we were. You know, without Russia and Saudi sorting this out, this price spike is not going to be long lasting. So we are getting closer to that point. Don't get me wrong. Um, you know, the fact that we, we've come as far as we have. I mean, if I start looking here on the 90 minute, um, this is where we had that OPEC meeting. You remember they failed to, to see eye to eye. They didn't cut. Markets saw an aggressive gap down, and and that was when the Saudis were saying they were going to flood the market and discount prices. Then we had that temporary reprieve on the back of the U.S. saying, "Well, we're going to buy oil and top up the the SPR." Didn't last long. And if you look where we are now, we've come up to the 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 top of of that range that we were in um, really last week had a brief break through that but it's going to be interesting to see it's quite key where we're really trading at the moment but all of this for me still hinges on really the russians being more forthcoming the saudis we know have been a little bit more open to the idea that they want action it's the russians that haven't agreed at this point point. and some of the latest that i've seen this morning is opec plus reportedly to hold a meeting next week said to be monday uh, according to a few people um, it's kind of journalists who who monitor and track the, the, the behind closed doors conversations so yeah um, hopefully that that helps I mean as far as today's calendar is concerned um, yeah it's all dominated by the afternoon uh, there's a few things coming out this morning but quite frankly it probably doesn't even warrant me commenting on uh, I think these service numbers are all um, final ones uh, probably the one perhaps that you can keep an eye on will be the service PMI coming out of the UK uh, just given the composition of our economy and and the service one in the UK does be uh, tend to be market moving and that is expected to be 34.8 uh, down from a, a 53.2 reading so a severe hit uh, of course to that figure um, and then the payrolls report so again the registration link will be in the chat so, so check that out and hopefully I'll see you a bit later on this afternoon Okay, guys, that is it. Enjoy your weekend. Uh, and any questions, just leave a, a comment in the video. Thanks very much.